Welcome to NWAETC Project ECHO. I'd like to ask Dr. Ramers to give the presentation today. It's great to be here with you today. Good to see everyone out there. I'm going to talk today about post-exposure prophylaxis, mostly about HIV. I think at the very end I have one or two slides on hepatitis B. And I just wanted to say by way of introduction, this is a topic that uh, as AETC trainers we kind of love to hate because it's a lot different than a lot of other areas of HIV medicine in that there's a lot of research going on all the time in antiretroviral therapy and in opportunistic infections. And in this area, unfortunately, the most recent guidance that we have from the CDC is from 2005. And I think you'll see that uh, a lot's changed in the, in the world of HIV medicine since then. So it kind of um, leaves us in a data-free zone uh, to make a lot of um, guesses in some cases. <clears throat> so here's the outline of what I'd like to talk about today. I want to talk a little bit about exposures in general. And I'll be talking about HBV and HIV, how to classify the exposure, um, how to define it, whether it's even an exposure or not, and then give the best estimates that we have for transmission of these agents um, uh, in, in occupational situations. I'll then talk mostly about HIV post-exposure prophylaxis, which we call PEP, and go through some practical management considerations, the timing and duration of PEP, how to choose a regimen, and what to do in terms of laboratory monitoring. And then at the end, I'll talk about hepatitis B PEP. I always like to disclose my sources right up at, at the front, and these two documents are the ones I referred to, 2005, uh, for both of them, and they're basically the CDC's guidance on post-exposure prophylaxis. On the top left, it is for occupational exposures, and on the bottom right, this is for non-occupational exposures, mainly sexual and injection drug use. I'm going to focus on the occupational situation here on the top left, and we've been hearing for a couple of years now that there are new versions of this, this, this set of guidelines that actually were expected in 2011. There's some published articles that say, uh, you know, new guidelines coming, but um, the latest we've heard is maybe soon, uh, really to update the use of the newer antiretrovirals that have been approved since 2005. So hopefully this year we'll see new ones. But in the meantime, we have uh, some guidance that's a little bit more recent. This is a, a publication which was done by uh, Kathy Hall, Chris Behrens, and David Spock from our own Northwest AETC, collaborating <coughs> with Riverstone Health in Montana. And this is a guide that's available at our website, and I put the direct address at the bottom of this slide here. Uh, and this is an outstanding resource for a couple of reasons. The first is that it was published in 2009, mm -hmm. so it addresses the use of some newer antiretroviral agents. And the second has to do with just the way it's laid out. I'll show you on the right here how these chapters are laid out, and it basically goes, walks you through step by step from each step of the whole interaction, from the initial visit to the 72-hour follow-up visit to the two-week visit, and all the way through, and it's just a really nice, comprehensive kind of checklist way of, of looking at this. So we can email this out to you, and it's also available just on our AETC website. So let's start with definitions. What are we talking about here? There's, there's a lot in the news about PrEP, and I want to differentiate PEP from PrEP. PrEP would be pre-exposure prophylaxis, and PEP, of course, is post-exposure prophylaxis. So we're talking about the use of therapeutic agents to prevent infection following the exposure to a given pathogen. And when we're talking about healthcare worker exposures, we're really talking about HIV and hepatitis B mainly. It's not that hepatitis C isn't important, it's just that we have nothing we can really do about it. Uh, and for HIV, we're talking about pills mainly, and for hepatitis B, we're talking about immunoglobulin and vaccine. So the first thing you do uh, when you're faced with the situation is to define the exposure in the best way that you can. And the CDC uh, documents are pretty good about telling you what counts and what doesn't count. So on the left-hand side here, you can see what we consider an exposure, obviously a blood transfusion with contaminated blood, an intravenous intramuscular sub-Q needle injury with potentially infectious fluid, and I'll, we'll go into what that means in a little bit. You can see the asterisk there. A mucous membrane splash or a, a area of broken skin involved in a splash, also with potentially infectious fluid, and then uh, the dreaded human bites that come up every once in a while in our practice. What doesn't count as an exposure? Uh, intact skin, really, if it's working fine, should protect you from a splash, even if it's with potentially infectious fluid. If we have needle injury that does not involve infectious fluid, for example, an injection that was prepared and maybe a needle stick happened without any blood being involved, that would not really count as an exposure. The needle should be sterile. And then a mucous membrane or skin break, break splash with a fluid that is not considered infectious really does not require post-exposure prophylaxis. And then this last one is kind of uh, amusing, I find, that human bites that do not have blood involved really do not require prophylaxis. 
<laughs> oh, and of course, sex. We, we can't forget about sex. So what about this term, potentially infectious fluid? The first thing is that I'm talking about HIV and hepatitis C on this first slide, and the next one I'll talk about hepatitis B, which is slightly different. So these uh, fluids on the left are things that we know or we at least worry about being um, possible vectors for HIV transmission. Blood is the obvious one, semen and vaginal fluid for obvious reasons, but these other ones as well, pus, amniotic fluid, spinal, pleural, synovial, and peritoneal fluid, and then breast milk as well. What does not count as a potentially infectious fluid? Over here on the right, saliva, sputum, urine, feces, vomit, sweat, tears, and nasal secretions, unless these are obviously invisibly contaminated with blood. And of course, that's a judgment call sometimes um, in the hospital that you will just be forced to make. On this slide, we have hepatitis B, and you'll see the one thing I've tried to really highlight in orange here is that saliva and sputum are actually known to be infectious for hepatitis B. And if you look at hepatitis B epidemiology throughout the world, there's probably a lot of horizontal transmission that's happening between children uh, in Southeast Asia and in Africa involving saliva and sputum. And to remember what the transmission risks are, it's really nice because it lines up pretty close to these exact numbers, and we use it uh, called the rule of three. And if you actually notice hepatitis B, hepatitis C, and HIV, if you line them up this way, are alphabetical order as well. And so it goes descending from 30% risk to 3% to 0.3% risk in terms of needle stick transmission rates. Of course, these are just estimates, and it's from very limited data, but it's the best that we have. Now, going a little bit more detail on HIV, I wanted to show just the relative risks of different types of exposures. And up here at the top, you have occupational percutaneous and mucocutaneous exposure at estimated 0.3 and 0.09%. And I just put the other uh, known risks for HIV on there, a couple of them, uh, with receptive anal intercourse being the higher one here, 1 to 2 percent risk. Of course, these are modulated by different factors, depending on the viral load of the source patient, uh, in the case of sexual exposure, depending on the concomitant uh, sexually transmitted infections and so forth. So let's get into HIV PEP a little bit more detail. So I can fit all the evidence, or most of the evidence for HIV PEP on a single slide here. So a lot of it comes from animal model, models. And what we know is that there's a high level of protection when PEP is started within 24 hours of exposure. And in similar experiments using a, a, a macaque model with an HIV challenge, um, 28 days of PEP is known to be more effective than three days or 10 days. And so really, uh, this is probably the only experiments that are going to be done in this area. And what we're left with is starting PEP as early as possible and continuing for 28 days. And that's what's been done in subsequent trials. There was a case control study using uh, oral zidovudine, or AZT, back in the 90s. And that's really the one trial that we lean on a lot in terms of giving us the effectiveness of PEP. And that showed an 81% decrease in the risk of HIV acquisition in those that got AZT PEP. So what we think uh, these days when we use more than just one drug, we think it's at least 81% effective and probably more. But what's the evidence for using two drugs or even three drugs? Really, there's not much evidence at all because these experiments are really unethical to do. We know that some people still do seroconvert despite a three-drug PEP regimen, and so that implies that our effectiveness is less than 100% but we know that it's, it's probably well above 81%. And if we think of this theoretically in terms of the timing of when PEP should be started, the risks of PEP are pretty much constant. We know that these are drugs that have certain toxicities and those are going to be constant through time. And we know from these animal experiments that the benefits uh, of PEP are decreasing over time. And so the real question is when do these lines cross and when is it really no longer worth it to start PEP? The CDC has some guidance here. It's a little bit fuzzy, but here's what the CDC says in the document from 2005. Really, it should be as soon as possible and preferably within hours rather than days. That trial with AZT that I mentioned earlier, they actually were able to start PEP within four hours. And so this has important implications in terms of uh, system of care, what you do to get the first dose into people as soon as possible. And in most cases, in a hospital or clinic setting, that means the ER right away and get the first dose in right away and then sort of make decisions later. Secondly, the CDC says that the interval after which there's no benefit is not really known, um, and they suggest obtaining expert advice when the interval has succeed, exceeded 24 to 36 hours. I'll say in practice that we use 72 hours as usually a good benchmark for um, when we would stop offer, offering PEP or when we feel that there's not really much evidence that, it, that it's going to help. <clears throat> 
And so here's a, just a snapshot from uh, the HIV web study website. This is the crux of the um, choice between two and three drugs. And what this shows is you classify the exposure as less severe or more severe, and those are just really intuitive things. Uh, hollow needles being worse than solid needles and superficial injuries being um, not as concerning as deeper injuries. And then you uh, quantify the source of the infection as well. And HIV class one here, this is not the HIV staging system, it's just saying a light exposure or a heavy exposure and those have to do with um, how much virus is probably there. You can see on the bottom there, class one would be an asymptomatic person or somebody with an undetectable viral load. And class two would be symptomatic, uh, end-stage AIDS, acute illness, or a known high HIV RNA viral load. And that really just, it, it's kind of, you can see these are fuzzy things, but basically it's deciding between two drugs or three drugs in this table. There's another table here which has to do with uh, non-occupational, um, I'm sorry, this, this has to do with mucocutaneous exposure, and it's the same type of thing. You classify the source infection and you, and you classify the exposure type as being a small volume or a large volume. And you can see in more cases, in the case of mucocutaneous exposure, you would use just two drugs instead of three. So let's get into the actual antiretrovirals that we choose. These are the ones that are recommended in the CDC document. And you can see a lot of these regimens are really kind of outdated. I can't really remember ever prescribing indinavir, sequinavir, or fosamprenavir recently, but these are what's, what's in, the, in the documents here. They divide things into basic regimens, which contain two active agents on the top, and those being comavir with zidovudine, lamivudine, or Truvada with tenofovir, amtricitabine. And then an expanded regimen would be a third active drug. In this case, they're all protease inhibitors added onto that. And you can just see the pill burdens really get um, to be quite high towards the end here. If you were to put somebody on uh, indinavir or sequinavir, you're looking at six tablets just for the protease inhibitor itself, plus uh, whatever you've started with. And so here's what I would consider more modern PEP regimens. Again, this is not really in the guidelines because the guidelines are older, but it is in this AETC document I mentioned at the beginning. Really, we use tenofovir emtricitabine as the basic regimen uh, as containing two pills, two active agents, and that's just one tab uh, daily. And then on top of that, if we're going to add a third agent, we typically will add adizanavir and ritonavir, and so that brings you up to three tablets uh, once a day. We sometimes use darunavir and ritonavir, which would be um, four tabs total once a day. And then raltegavir is a... Uh, uh, a newer agent which has not been studied all that much but uh, and also brings in the twice a day um, problem but it's also been looked at more and more with PEP. So I did find some recent data on PEP. Um, it's, it's kind of hard to find. There are ongoing trials that I, I, I saw at clinicaltrials.gov looking at some of the newer agents such as raltegavir and maraviroc. Um, but this is something that was published in, in CROI at 2011 and it's, it's the experience from the National Clinical Consultation Center which maintains something called the PEP line. Uh, which, if you don't know about it, it's one of the great resources available to you as a clinician to call any time there's been a needle stick and, and to give you advice about what to do. And what they did is they took a year, I think it was 2009, they took all of their PEP calls for 2009 and just looked at the regimens that were actually recommended. And I was kind of surprised that 86% of the time they actually stuck within the CDC guidelines and recommended one of the older regimens. About 14% of the time, they went for non-guideline ARVs. So even the National Clinical Consultation Center uh, is advising non-guideline regimens um, in some cases. And if you look at the regimens that they were using, they're over here on the right, darunavir, ritonavir, raltegavir, and adizanavir, ritonavir, the three that I listed on the prior slide. They also looked at the reasons why they would recommend a non-guideline ARV, and those are here. And in most cases for them, it was known ARV resistance. So if you have information available on the source patient, that is a situation where you definitely would want to use a regimen for PEP that would be considered active uh, for the virus that the patient has. And what about follow-up? Um, I kind of divide this into two sections here. Here's a nice chart for you to follow, and this also appears in, in the um, AETC document I talked about. Really, the first couple of weeks, you're, you're trying to get a baseline idea of what's going on. You certainly want to make sure that um, you know this patient's serostatus before you start them on medicines. If you pick up an HIV diagnosis right at the outset, you know it, it, that the patient had this before they were exposed via the needle stick. And then the, the other labs here, a CBC, liver test, and BUN are really to see if there's any toxicity that you're, they're causing. You, of course, want to do a pregnancy test in women of childbearing age. And then subsequently, you can see it's really the HIV antibody test that we would do at six weeks, three months, and six months. People are, uh, 
ask often if it's worthwhile to do a viral load test, which would be a more sensitive way to diagnose acute HIV. And while that's theoretically true, that it would be more sensitive, it's not something that's done in practice, mainly because the viral load test was not designed for this purpose, and it would definitely not be cost effective to be doing viral loads on everybody that was exposed. I think it's a different situation if somebody has a clinical illness consistent with acute retroviral syndrome, which would be a flu-like illness, plus or minus a rash, plus or minus um, some uh, fatigue and maybe some uh, meningeal symptoms. That would be a case where you might want to do an HIV viral load as a diagnostic test, but it's not really used in routine screening of people exposed to HIV. So just a couple of slides on hepatitis B before we finish. Hepatitis B, PEP is not something we think about uh, very often for a couple of reasons. First of all, the hepatitis B prevalence is rather low in the U.S., and um, you can see the incidence in this chart here. It's another vaccine success story, uh, the comprehensive elimination strategy that was started in 1991. <laughs> Uh, which uh, now has hepatitis B vaccination as part of the childhood immunization schedule, really has brought the incidence very low. And so most cases of hepatitis B are actually imported these days. Secondly, most health care workers are vaccinated, and so they are protected against an exposure to hepatitis B. But if one does occur and you have an unvaccinated health care worker or somebody who did not respond to the vaccine, the uh, PEP that we use for hepatitis B is to immunize them to start with their first dose as soon as you can and give something called hepatitis B immune globulin. The nice news about this is it's effective up to a week after exposure, so you don't have to get that first dose in right away. You have time to call for help. So in summary, uh, HIV PEP should be offered within hours of exposure and is given for 28 days. Counseling is really crucial to discuss the true risks and benefits of PEP, and we have a lot of gray area in this field where we end up um, kind of making decisions based on side effects and that kind of thing. I didn't mention this in the talk, but healthcare workers who are taking PEP actually have more side effects than people with HIV taking antiretrovirals for their own health. So we end up doing a lot of hand-holding and a lot of symptom management that way. Providers can choose a two or a three drug regimen based on exposure and source, and I gave you the regimens um, in the table earlier. And then hepatitis B PEP involves hepatitis B immune globulin and HBD vaccination. I want to finish with some resources. I mentioned the PEP line. This is a great resource. There's the website there. This is available to anybody. And I think they get about 900 calls per month uh, from all of their services. They have a, a line that's just a, a general clinical consultation line. They have one that's a PEP line, and they have one that's a perinatal line specifically. So a very busy and valuable service. I saw on their website that they actually have business hours now. It used to be 24-7, and now it's offered 9 a.m. until 2 a.m. I think that had to do with funding considerations. But I do believe that you can leave a message at all hours of the day that they'll return promptly. Secondly, I wanted to just say the CDC has some great resources there. The two documents I referred to earlier are available at aidsinfo.nih.gov. Uh, and then our PEP manual that I referred to from the AETC is there at that link at the bottom.